We've been examining a statement by Thurman Arnold in the Symbols of Government that great constructive achievements in human organization have been accomplished by unscrupulous men who violated most of the principles we cherish. We've described and discussed John D. Rockefeller, economic cartel in a couple of sessions, Boss Tweed and a political cartel. We've also been considering Joseph Schumpeter's concept that economic progress in capitalist society means turmoil. Today, we'll be going to the world of finance, high finance in the 19th century, another world of great turmoil. The title of today's talk is Fisk and Gould, Financial Follies in the Gilded Age. I was studying Italian a while ago, preparing for a trip to Italy, when I came across the Italian word for corner. It is langolo, not unlike the English word for angle. Now, I'm not an etymologist, but I think it's more than a mere coincidence that the financial angle, known as the corner, became a part of the American entrepreneurial zeitgeist. Our American experience with corners goes back over 300 years to the shrewd 17th century Dutch fur trader Frederick Phillips, founder of a dynasty that eventually came to own most of what is now Westchester County. Phillips built the magnificent Hudson River estate known as Phillipsburg Manor. A number of you may have visited that. And Phillips initially earned his money the hard way, the old-fashioned way. He married a wealthy widow. <laughs> but the young Phillips used part of her fortune as seed money to finance a bold venture up the Hudson and into Indian territory to trade guns and other implements for furs. Well, the young Frederick soon discovered that the Indians valued certain bright, shiny beads derived from clamshells, which they crafted into necklaces and wore as symbols of wealth. They called them wampum. The more wampum one wore around one's neck, the more powerful one was. Resultantly, wampum, like money or gold, had become a convenient medium of exchange. So the crafty Phillips concocted a plan. He went out to buy up all the wampum he could lay his hands on, retire it from circulation by stowing it in large hogshead barrels in his basement. Well, things eventually got to the point where the Indians just couldn't or wouldn't produce the stuff faster than Phillips would remove it from circulation. The result was that Phillips pulled off the first known corner on the North American continent. Unbelievably, Phillips had cornered the wampum market. As a result, no one could buy Indian furs without coming to Phillips, and he now single-handedly controlled the price of fur. The early settlers and the Indians never knew what hit them. Long before the advent of the Central Bank, long before Federal Reserve Board and the coming of the Greenspans and the Bernankes, Frederick Phillips, a young Dutch carpenter, had appointed himself controller of the currency and the Federal Reserve Board chairman combined, and he reigned supreme for decades and amassed a fortune which is intact to this day. Well, following this matchless American entrepreneurial tradition, two 19th century scoundrels named James Fisk Jr. and Jay Gould set out to play the corner angle in 1868 and 1869. The resultant panics nearly toppled an administration and our monetary system along with it. But unfortunately, their antics in 1869 in particular would ultimately have more far-reaching and sinister effects on our rural populace. This is the story. First, a word about the phenomenon of the corner. Obviously, the object of a corner is to control all there is of a particular item, such as a commodity, so that whoever needs the item must come to you. And since the potential buyer can't get it elsewhere, you have free reign over the price. This power becomes particularly draconian when it's utilized in connection with an event known as the short sale. A short seller simply sells something he doesn't own by borrowing it, with the expectation the price will drop, and then he'll buy it back cheaper, return the borrowed item, keep the profit. All is well for the bear or the short seller, unless the price rises, but if it does, there's an old Wall Street adage about the consequence corned by the renegade 19th century trader known as Old Daniel Drew. Quote, him that sells what isn't hisn must buy it back or go to prison. <laughs> Clearly anyone who has cornered a market is in a position to squeeze bears unmercifully, particularly if the bears have borrowed heavily on the way in. 
But to corner the market in products held in bulk by the United States government, such as currency or gold, one must know the policy of the government or perhaps have a direct line into the Treasury as sales or purchases by the U.S. Treasury can drive markets in such commodities. And so to the infamous currency and gold corners of Jim Fisk and Jay Gould. But who were these guys? Jay Gould emerged from a poverty-ridden dairy farm in upstate New York in the mid-1800s. His mother, unfortunately, died when he was only five. And Gould was raised by a frustrated, dysfunctional father who would lock poor Jay in the cellar for days at a time. Gould learned to survive this depraved background by cheating. Dollars count, nothing else. How you get them doesn't matter. Loyalty is a virtue only so long as it serves your purpose. In short, Gould was the quintessential unscrupulous Thurman Arnold brigand. With this mindset, Jay Gould arrived in New York City in 1858 to seek his fortune as a stockbroker. Four years later, he formed his own brokerage firm, Smith Gould Martin & Company, a name that was to become infamous on Wall Street as Gould would evolve into a dark presence there. At about the same time, Gould began to accumulate Erie Railroad stock, and as a result, he was soon noticed by that keen-eyed observer, the treasurer of Erie, old Daniel Drew, who brought him onto the board. Drew had made a fortune as a cattle drover by salting his Longhorn's cattle feed to add weight. Watered stock, they called it. The term proved prescient. At about the same time, Gould's partner-to-be, James Fisk, Jr., also arrived on the New York financial scene. Fisk was a perfect foil for the self-possessed Gould. Gould was thin and full-bearded. Fisk was stocky and beardless. He wore a finely waxed mustache. Gould was silent and secretive to a fault. Fisk was in your face, boisterous. Gould was a quiet family man. Fisk was a notorious womanizer. His extramarital affair with a gal by the name of Josie Mansfield, regarded by New York society as a scarlet woman, was the most talked about open secret of the decade. Gould dressed conservatively. Fisk preferred nothing more than a parade around dressed as an army colonel or a steamship commander. Of course, he was neither. Gould did not conspicuously wear jewelry. Fisk sported a large diamond stick pin on his lapel and three gold stars on his sleeve. Long before he arrived in New York, Fisk's training had been as a circus barker and as a door-to-door -door houseware salesman. Fisk would ride in unannounced to a country town on wagons, decorated in circus colors, and people loved it. He had learned to survive in the hostile, no-holds-barred world of the eastern frontier. Eventually, Fisk was spotted by Jordan Marsh department store executives, Boston, who tapped him as a sales agent. He thrived in that capacity, but no more so than during the Civil War. Fisk, just like John D. Rockefeller, bought his way out of the Union Army by payment of the obligatory $300. But unlike Rockefeller, Fisk spent the rest of the war performing his patriotic duty by buying black market Confederate cotton and delivering it to Jordan Marsh to be made into uniforms for the Union Army. Well, old Daniel Drew latched onto Fisk at about the time he tapped Gould, and with the two of them in house, he proceeded to launch an attack on the most formidable financial figure of the time, Commodore Cornelius Vanderbilt. Vanderbilt at the time controlled the New York Central System, the Erie Railroad was all that stood between the Commodore and total control of all lines west of Buffalo. Vanderbilt had been accumulating Erie shares. There seemed to be no way to stop him from gaining controlling interest. Drew's two neophytes, Fisk and Gould, utterly unhampered by Wall Street precedent or protocol, soon discovered one. It was a printing press. They would water Erie stock just as their mentor Drew had watered his longhorns. They concocted a scheme to issue $10 million of debentures convertible into Erie common stock, ostensibly to finance the purchase of new rails and equipment. The entire stock issue was cranked out over a weekend on their private printing press. The net effect, of course, was to flood the market with bogus Erie shares and to feed them to the rapacious Commodore Vanderbilt. H.W. Brands, in a book called The Money Man, quotes Fisk. If this printing press doesn't break down, I'll be damned if I don't give the old hog all he wants. Well, as the market opened on Monday morning, out of the livid Commodore's command center came the defiant order, quote, buy all the stock the sons of bitches can sell. 
They think they can pick my pocket, do they? Well, by God, I'll show them there's such a thing as law in this state. He was wrong. The Commodore, a notorious briber of both judges and legislators, reportedly spent eight to ten million dollars purchasing Erie shares. But the printing press just kept rolling them out. Then suddenly the price plummeted as supply outran demand, but the control of the board remained just where it had been, as the more that Vanderbilt bought, the more the total outstanding became. By the time Vanderbilt finally caught on and bought New York State Supreme Court Judge George Barnard, a Tweed judge for hire, to issue an injunction and to impound the printing press, Fisk and Gould had taken the Commodore for $8 million, and they had complete control of the Erie Board and of the Erie Books and Records. After a hasty celebration downtown at Delmonico's restaurant, the duo took off by rowboat for New Jersey, with the Erie Books and Records safely tucked under their arms and just ahead of the Barnard Sheriff. They simply set up the Erie office in New Jersey. New Jersey authorities, hoping to garner some of the business that the Erie headquarters could generate, welcomed them with open arms, even supplied bodyguard protection. They needed it to fend off Vanderbilt's toughs, who soon surfaced across the river in New Jersey, but were physically rebuffed. It was the financial world of the Wild West, no holds barred, and old Daniel's two wunderkinds of Erie though just over 30 years of age, had just taken on the King Kong of the rail loan industry, and they were still very much on their feet. Wall Street watched in wonder and admiration. Well, the battle now shifted to the legislature in Albany. That august body, once characterized by George Templeton Strong as the Sanhedrin of rascality, and by Ambrose Pierce in the Devil's Dictionary, is that body of elderly gentlemen charged with high duties and misdemeanors. Boss Tweed, a past master at this game, was at the time aligned with Vanderbilt. Tweed and Gould each arrived in Albany carrying large bags containing over $1 million in currency. The battle was over opposing legislation to legitimize or invalidate the bogus shares of Erie. Tweed ran short of cash. Vanderbilt sent bags full of cash reinforcements by messenger. Gould deftly intercepted the messenger and paid him $70,000 to disappear. When he promptly did, the Commodore finally threw up his hands. He'd had enough. It never pays to kick a skunk, exclaimed perhaps the most redolent predator on the street. Call off the bribes. A pall now fell over the Albany legislators. If you had sold the entire New York State legislature short, in the words of the famous sportscaster Warner Wolf, if you'd sold him short the day before, you won. Only 24 hours earlier, the honorable representatives in Albany were licking their chops as the price per vote had spiraled over $1,000, about $20,000 in today's money. Now they were lucky to pick up a mere $100 per vote, and the price was dropping by the hour. But something more significant had happened here. During the fight, Jim Fisk had won over Boss Tweed who suddenly realized that in Fisk, he had finally met his match in corrupting politicians and gaming the system. Fisk and Tweed were to become soulmates, and Tweed's control of the courts would not only prove invaluable to Fisk and Gould in a financial sense, it would undoubtedly save their lives. Well, old Daniel Drew had switched sides, not an uncommon phenomenon with old Daniel Drew, and he joined the Commodore in the middle of the fight. It wouldn't be the last time. Lawsuits and legislation followed in rapid fire succession amidst accusations and counter accusations of fraud as the fate of Erie was mired in the mass of confusion. When the smoke finally cleared, Fisk and Gould were in control of the Erie, but they had paid Vanderbilt $4,750,000 for half of the tainted printing press shares he had been swindled into purchasing. Altogether, Drew and various others who had banded together with him escaped with $9 million. All of it, Erie's money. Of course, the Erie shareholders were still in the dark as to what was happening. They had no clue. The two 31-year-old railroad magnates, Jay Gould, Jim Fisk, now controlled a railroad. But it was out of money, and it had needs. Their first move was to appoint Boss Tweed to the board, thus securing the cooperation of the New York judiciary, which Tweed carried in his hip pocket. Remember, there was that three-year period 
69 to 71, during which Tweed, very, very powerful. The judiciary would prove to be a defining chess piece in the game yet to be played. Since the railroad was in desperate financial straits, the wily Vanderbilt figured he'd soon pick it up by raiding the stock as it fell in price and finally realized his fondest ambition of eliminating all rail competition from New York to the West. He underestimated young Fisk and Gould and their newfound ally, Boss Tweed. To rectify Erie's desperate financial plight, the twosome cooked up their first financial corner. In retrospect, it was to foreshadow even greater things to come. This time around, they would simply seek to corner the money supply in New York. The term for their ambitious project was a money lockup. Author Kenneth Ackerman, in a fascinating read about Gould and Fisk entitled The Gold Ring, estimates that the total U.S. money supply in 1868 was only $1.38 billion. It has increased over 5,000 times since then, whereas our population has only increased nine times since then. Bank deposits, Ackerman informs us, were only $800 million, coast to coast. And only a fraction of this amount was in New York City. Remember, although there was a rudimentary telegraph system, there was no electronic money transfer yet in existence. Physical location of currency, therefore, was important. Ackerman continues by pointing out that if only 20 to $30 million were removed from the money system in New York and locked up, that would have a significant effect. Credit would dry up. Banks faced with a liquidity crunch would have to call in loans, interest rates, would shoot up dramatically and stock prices would plummet. There was no SEC then, there were no rules, as there are today barring short sales after a downtick, and there was no central bank hovering over the interest rate market with the ultimate weapons of raising or lowering the federal funds rate and issuing federal bonds. Fisk and Gould set their bar high. They set about to lock up no less than the entire New York money supply in order to depress the stock of Erie. They were in a position to withhold $12 million from the market. Drew, now with them, could withdraw another $4 million from the banks. Boss Tweed, who controlled the municipal treasury and the 10th National Bank in New York, could withdraw another $8 million of municipal money and withhold yet another $20 million from accounts he controlled, $44 million in all. All of this just to depress the Erie stock. Well, the lockup worked. Money became tight. Banks began to call in loans due to the credit squeeze. Rumors of watered Erie stock began to leak out. The price of Erie shares dropped from 48 to 40. When he was questioned about the rumors, Gould readily admitted that the Erie had issued additional stock and even hinted that the Erie might soon have to default on its commercial paper. The news hit Wall Street with a thud. Erie dropped to 38. And when news then leaked out that a group of speculators had tied up perhaps as much as 10 to $15 million in currency, panic began to pervade the market. Bond prices, commodity prices, stock prices, all began a dramatic drop in tandem. Interest rates skyrocketed as the banks had precious little money left to lend out. The real scramble to sell was on, and investors now rushed like lemmings to the sea to unload stock and hurdle themselves over a financial cliff. Finally, the U.S. government was becoming concerned. The cold weather was almost on us. With wheat prices weakening, how could the farmers survive the winter? So the government acted. The New York sub-treasury spread the word it was prepared to release $50 million into the market. The mere threat of it was enough. Fisk and Gould heard the expected thunder from Washington, and they turned on a dime. They had previously bought Erie shares heavily at prices in the mid-30s, all they could lay their hands on. Now, they quickly covered their short sales, began to bet heavily on the sales price rise. They knew what happened when they released the money lockup, and only they knew that they were about to release the money lockup. Overnight, the market turned right with them. On the Saturday following the Treasury announcement, Fisk and Gould released $12 million in currency to the banks. Together with Tweed, they essentially opened up the entire lockup in one day. And in one day, Erie shot from 35 to 61, finally settling at 53. Well, what had happened here? In a much larger sense, same thing that happened to the settler fur traders during Frederick Phillips' wampum corner in the 1600s. Speculator bears needed Erie stock. They had sold short and borrowed stock to do it at prices in the 40s and the 30s. They owed stock they didn't have. 
The only people that had the Erie stock were Fisk and Gould. They were in a position to squeeze, and squeeze they did. A group of so-called sophisticated speculators, including the renowned financier August Belmont, the Rothschilds represented the United States, were caught short of Erie stock. They had sold Erie short at the very bottom of the market during the money crunch. Belmont and his colleagues, who had simply bet the wrong way, now formed a so-called reform group to depose the two Erie wizards, Gould and Fisk. What happened next was a classic power play gone wrong. The so-called reform group, having met on Saturday, had lined up a friendly judge of the New York Supreme Court named Josiah Sutherland. What would they do? They would file an investor's complaint on Monday morning charging massive fraud and mismanagement of the Erie, and they would obtain a temporary restraining order placing the Erie into receivership and appointing a friendly receiver to oust Fisk and Gould, marshal Erie's assets, and incidentally, of course, to help them recoup their rather substantial trading losses. The plan backfired. The so-called reformers had been joined that Saturday by none other than good old Daniel Drew. It seems that good old Daniel had double-crossed his partners yet again. In the middle of the downslide, while Fisk and Gould were buying, old Daniel had sold short, borrowing thousands of shares. But this time, old Daniel was caught short when the momentum suddenly swung back precipitously overnight with the Fisk, Gould, and Tweed money release following right on the heels of the sub-treasury threat. Daniel was not on the inside of that. After meeting with the reformers on Friday and learning of their court strategy, old Daniel met with Fisk and Gould that Saturday night and pleaded with them to lend him the thousands of shares of Erie he needed to cover his short positions. They refused, but in the process, Drew let slip that Fisk and Gould were about to lose control of the railroad by court-appointed receivership that Monday morning anyway. Fortunately for the young duo, Tweed had Judge George Barnard of the New York Supreme Court in his stable. Judge Barnard was an early riser, whereas the Honorable Josiah Sutherland was not. By the time Sutherland sauntered sleepily into his chambers on Monday morning to be met by the contingent of Belmont's reform group, lawyers with petitions, the early bird Judge Barnard had beaten them to the punch and had already issued an order placing the Erie in receivership. Barnard, of course, had appointed the eminently qualified Jay Gould as receiver and the equally worthy controller James Fisk as bondsman. Tweed, of course, was responsible for electing the Honorable George Barnard to the bench. When Tweed was once asked about Barnard's qualifications for the vaunted post of Supreme Court judge, he is alleged to have said, quote, George knows about as much about the law as a yellow dog, end quote, which is about all he had to know as attorney Jay Sherman had produced an appeal-proof set of papers over the weekend, which Barnard could simply sign, and they were first. George Barnard, the best judge that money could buy, now issued yet another enlightened edict from the bench. He ordered the Erie receiver to buy back all 200,000 shares of Erie stock at market. By that time, $100 per share. All of the Erie shares that had been gobbled up by Fisk and Gould at bargain basement prices during the money lockup and during the panic that followed the lockup were now sold back to the Erie, by court order, no less, at an enormous profit. Was it any wonder that a chastened old Daniel Drew exclaimed of his erstwhile young protege, Gould, quote, his touch is death. It was the area of the Wild West. We've all seen the movies since we were kids. Indians raided settlers, outlaws raided trains, hard drinking, hard cussing cowboys raided farmers and raided each other's horses and cattle for that matter. It was the age of deputy sheriffs and frontier justice of Billy the Kid and Custer and Geronimo, and shootouts at the OK Corral. At least that's what we see a lot of on screen and television. But the really wild action was in the East on Wall Street, and the Raiders were two young, utterly amoral financial opportunists as unlike each other as Cain and Abel, who had already succeeded beyond anyone's wildest expectations. In our current regulatory climate, they would both have already been jailed for life for massive corporate fraud, insider trading. But in 1869, unrestrained in the chaos, young Fisk and Gould had just begun. Some of the stories of the duo's battles with the avaricious Commodore Vanderbilt are memorable. I'll tell you just one. 
Vanderbilt's New York Central was the Erie's fiercest competitor. At one point, the Erie was all that stood between the Commodore and a corner on hauling livestock between Buffalo and New York City. As this end route was a key to Vanderbilt controlling all the livestock traffic from points west, a rate war was inevitable. Fisk and Gould led off by dropping the rate from $125 per carload down to $75. Vanderbilt countered, reducing the price yet further to $50. When Fisk and Gould went to $25 a carload, Vanderbilt decided to end the competition once and for all, dramatically cutting the price to $1 per carload and only one cent per head for hogs and sheep. Well, apparently that did it. The Commodore staff gleefully reported that there was now no livestock whatsoever on the Erie. Its cattle cars were traveling empty from Buffalo to New York City. All of the cows and sheep and the hogs were now enjoying the scenic route down the Hudson on the New York Central. They had won. The Commodore had finally beaten Fisk and Gould into the ground. It was only some time later that Vanderbilt, aghast, learned that Fisk and Gould had bought up every head of livestock west of Buffalo and were shipping the contented beasts down the scenic Hudson at a colossal profit courtesy of his New York Central Railroad. Which brings us to the most devastating of the Fisk Gould corner attempts, the attempt to corner gold. Out of necessity, Abraham Lincoln had detached the country from the gold standard during the Civil War. And he had made the greenback an acceptable form of currency but only on these shores. Purchases from abroad still required gold. Sales abroad were settled in gold. Gold payments from foreign buyers across the ocean, however, took time to get here. And with the delay came the risk of a downturn in the value of gold against the greenback. Well, capitalism abhors a vacuum. So both a thriving banking industry and a gold exchange grew out of the need of suppliers to deflect this risk. The bankers, for a handsome commission, would pay rural and other suppliers in greenbacks for their gold receivables, and then assume the risk of the value of gold fluctuating for the two or three months it would take the gold to arrive on these shores. In the grand old American entrepreneurial tradition of using other people's money, the bankers then went to the gold exchange on Wall Street, borrowed gold, sold it short using the proceeds of the short sale to collateralize their gold borrowings. Theoretically, they won when the price of gold fell. They lost when the price of gold rose. But in the end, as far as the bankers were concerned, it didn't much matter because eventually the gold would arrive from abroad and they would settle by delivering it to the parties who had lent them the gold. In effect, the bankers had shifted the risk for which they'd been handsomely commissioned previously to the gold traders and the speculators on the exchange. Some of them, however, just couldn't stand there and watch the traders get rich and unfortunately took positions unsupported by export loans. They became gamblers. The result of this was the development of an institution on Wall Street known as the Gold Room. H.W. Brands describes it as a den of the most dangerous transactions and quotes a regular's description as follows. It was a, quote, cavern full of dank and noisome vapors where the deadly carbonic acid was blended with the fumes of stale smoke and vinous breaths. A journalist wrote, imagine a rat pit in full blast with 20 or 30 men ranged around the rat tragedy, each with a canine under his arm yelling and howling at once, unquote. And yet in the midst of this maelstrom, some whimsically mad designer had placed a burbling statue of Cupid the symbol of purity and innocence, benignly spouting water into the air. What a scene. There was a finite supply of gold in New York available for trading, as the bulk of gold was held by the United States Treasury, which didn't circulate it much. Although gold could be shipped here from the West Coast, principally San Francisco, gangs like Jesse James threatened both stage and rail transport. So most of the gold in San Francisco tended to stay in San Francisco. And gold from Europe could take weeks, even months, to deliver. Moreover, there was no limit on the amount of gold any one person could accumulate for speculative purposes. So like wampum, there was a restricted supply, and the wily J. Gould sensed a corner opportunity, just like Frederick Phillips. 
In 1869, when Gould and Fisk decided to corner gold, there was only about $14 million in gold altogether in New York banks, and just a few million more in private hands here. And there were a lot of banker and speculator bears. Jay recognized that the key to this very thin market was the hoard of gold at the U.S. Treasury. Gold traders operated unafraid of a wampum-like corner, driving the price of gold, so long as the U.S. Treasury remained the ultimate player and its intentions remained undisclosed. Enter Emil Rathbone Corbin. Jenny Grant, the president's favorite younger sister, was a 37-year-old unmarried virgin. Although she was beautiful, she was reticent and naive, and apparently well on her way to perpetual spinsterhood when she was swept off her feet and promptly wed by the 61-year-old opportunistic widower, Emil Rathbone Corbin. Now, Corbin was a man with a fashionable New York City townhouse who hobnobbed with the elite of society. Despite the fact that he'd had a somewhat checkered career, tainted with scandal. In 1869, Corbin, now Grant's mother-in-law, began a dangerous relationship with the dark prince of Wall Street, Jay Gould. In the chess game that was to be played by Gould in his attempt to corner the thinly supplied gold market, Corbin would be the key to determine the moves of the U.S. Treasury, the ultimate chess piece. Corbin had the ear and the trust of President Grant. Gould supplied him with an intriguing theory. If the Treasury would only stand aside while gold prices rose, American products would become highly competitive, cheap to foreign buyers who dealt in gold. The only losers would be the short seller speculators on the gold exchange. Fisk, Gould, and their Wall Street partners now joined forces with Corbin to lock up both Grant and the gold supply. Here's how they did it. Emil Corbin introduced Gould to Grant on September 13, 1869, as Grant and his family were on their way to vacation in the wilds of the Pennsylvania foothills. At that meeting, the astute Gould discerned that Corbin's preachments of Gould's ingenious theories had indeed swayed Grant to rescind his recent order to the Treasury Secretary, George Boutwell, to sell gold. Before he left New York for a Pennsylvania vacation, Grant delivered a sealed letter to Corbin to hand deliver to Boutwell, which Corbin correctly felt directed Boutwell not to sell gold. When Corbin relayed this intelligence to Gould, the great New York gold rush of 1869 was on. Boutwell had his marching orders from Grant, stand pat, don't sell gold. And besides, Grant would now be almost unreachable in a little-known backwater Pennsylvania town fittingly called Washington, Pennsylvania. Fisk and Gould, armed with this bit of intelligence, attacked on September 18, 1869. They not only bought heavily, they spread rumors that the government was standing pat. Shouts of buy, buy now rang out through the rat pit, prompted, of course, by carefully positioned Smith Gould brokers. The stampede of the lemmings to the cliff was now on in earnest. But Gould, upon hearing that Treasury Secretary Boutwell would attend a Union League Club meeting that night, feared that Boutwell might be surrounded by banker bears. Perhaps they might convince Boutwell that tight money would cause interest rates to skyrocket, which alone could wipe out the American farmer. So Gould, too clever now by half, urged Corbin to write Grant a multi-page letter interlacing gold bull affirmations among such meandering family gossip as he could find. The attempted at camouflage proved transparent and was compounded by the means by which the letter was delivered by private messenger who went by private Erie rail car to Pennsylvania and then literally by Pony Express to the wilds of Pennsylvania to reach Grant. Grant figured that out. When the letter arrived, Grant realized he was being used and demanded that his wife Julia respond immediately to Grant's sister Jenny directing her and Corbin to disengage at once from the gold bowls. Julia's letter to Corbin was posted immediately and was scheduled to arrive in New York on Thursday, September 22. Meanwhile, all hell had broken loose in the gold rat pit. As a benign Cupid burbled on, the ebullient Fisk was directing a stampede of buying, and as he did so, the grain and wheat markets were severely impacted. Prices plummeted as banks, fearing a credit crunch, refused to lend gold, and when they did, charged exorbitant interest rates. 
The bears fought back with rumors that vast shipments of gold were on their way from abroad. But as the price dipped, Fisk and Gould brokers simply bought more gold, primarily through a floor broker named Albert Spires. Now, Spires was a small, owl-like creature with a wrinkled face who followed orders from Fisk unquestioningly like the good soldier Schweik. Winston Churchill once described a political opponent as, quote, a modest little person with a good deal to be modest about. It would have been a fitting description of Albert Spires. Spires and Fisk's other floor brokers responded to Fisk's every command, and they were driving the market. Fisk and Gould were already loaning out the very same gold they were buying, just as Gould had planned. And the battle of false rumors of the bears, Fisk and Gould floated equally false rumors of their own. Fictitious crises were manufactured on the spot. Spanish men of war were already sailing into New York Harbor. Attacks were imminent. The produce exchange brokers, both indignant and at the same time scared, now joined the bankers in a chorus of protest. But Julia's letter had not yet arrived. The U.S. Treasury, its hands tied by Grant's first letter, stood by in silence. The Fisk and Gould gold ring had power. They had backing them up the entire treasury of the Erie Railroad and of Tweed's 10th National Bank, which had invested much of the New York City Treasury money. Now hanging over the market like the sword of Damocles was the fact that the Fisk and Gould gold ring could now simply hold their gold and cause a rout since the supply was rapidly dwindling. Fisk had already let it slip that they intended to raise the price to $150 and beyond the very next day. Panic was gripping the market. Traders who had sold short already could not meet Fisk's margin calls. They couldn't buy at $150. They faced wipeout, bankruptcy, disgrace. Their families faced debtor prison. A number had already contemplated suicide. It was then that the letter from Julia arrived. Emil Rathbone Corbin was thunderstruck. Grant was clearly outraged that his brother-in-law and erstwhile confidant had been revealed as a crass opportunist. The president could turn his own family into paupers in a heartbeat. The scene bore all the markings of a Greek tragedy. Despite warnings to keep the contents of the letter in the strictest of confidence, Corbin immediately shared it with Gould. He wanted to sell out immediately as demanded by Grant. Gould knew that if Corbin did so, the market would crash. They would all be wiped out. Paid Corbin $100,000 to stand pat. Gould knew instinctively that he must instantly become a seller of gold, but he must do so secretly through a phalanx of brokers sworn to secrecy on a blood oath so as not to spook the market. The contents of Julia's letter were not to be made known, even to his partner, Fisk. The letter was burned. Meanwhile, the unsuspecting Fisk played his role to the hilt, striding onto the floor of the exchange that Thursday, proclaiming to one and all the price of gold was about to swell to 200. Gold was at 142, but following Fisk's outburst, prices began to rise precipitously. Spires was buying everything in sight, and rumors in the gold rat pit ran rampant. Fisk was close to Corbin. Corbin was close to Grant. Fisk knew something. While Fisk was leading the lemming buying parade, Gould was furtively selling. Trades were now coming thick and fast and could not be tabulated until late in the night. It was already unclear who was selling to who. Undoubtedly, in the furor and confusion, Gould was selling to Fisk. But as the price of gold rose steadily on Wall Street, goods in the Midwest could not be shipped. Hapless farmers were admonished to stop shipping wheat. The shippers who could do nothing without credit and interest rates were already out of sight. The farmers were like cattle being led to the slaughter, helpless. The farm community would never forget. But Fisk forged ahead unrestrained. The banker bears now besieged Treasury Secretary Boutwell, predicting the greatest depression in national history, unless he acted at once. But poor Boutwell, without Grant's presence, was helpless to do anything significant. Now, Grant finally arrived back in Washington. He learned of a $60,000 unsolicited gift of Greek statuary from Fisk, ordered it recreated and shipped out immediately. This veiled attempt at bribery was the last straw. On this day, September 23, while gold prices in New York were running rampant, the livid Grant did a 180-degree about-face. 
He ordered Boutwell to break the gold bulls, his brother-in-law be damned. Meanwhile, back in New York, as trading ended that Thursday, the unknowing Jim Fisk celebrated with Josie Mansfield. He was now master of the universe, virtually calling shots on the price of gold. The gold corner had worked, and the giddy Fisk could drive the price as high as he wished. Fisk was unaware that Gould's buying would save them both from disaster on the next day, September 24th, 1869, Black Friday. Gould already held the right to call an estimated six times the amount of gold certificates in the entire city of New York, and no one could sell short without coming to Fisk to borrow gold. Friday, September 24th, 1869, Black Friday, was to be Fisk's day in the sun. When he arrived at his temporary trading office on the street, immaculately turned out, gold was already selling at 145. Fisk now set spires loose, and the wizened old owl immediately bid the price up to 150, just as Fisk had openly predicted the day before. Trades now came so thick and fast that the quill pens of the gold exchange couldn't catch up. They hadn't even finished tabulating yesterday's trades. Deals would have to settle on the street outside. At 11 a.m., spires bid the price up to 155. Most traders now faced the unthinkable. They were unable to meet Fisk's margin calls. They were already technically insolvent. Their families were ruined. Now, Grant finally ordered Boutwell to sell $5 million in Treasury gold and to buy bonds, an unmistakable signal that the Treasury was entering the game. Spires, unaware of Grant's move and out of contact with Fisk, followed his marching orders and bid the gold price to $162. James Brown, the charismatic leader of the Banker Bears, had had enough. He accepted Spires' offer and sold his gold to Spires at $162. Traders gasped. But then, Boutwell's bombshell hit the market. Pandemonium reigned. The price of gold plummeted. The Lemming Bears charged after the announcement, yelling their sell orders at poor Spires, who was so totally disoriented that he just stood there in the middle of the floor, pathetically offering to pay $162 when the price had already plunged to $135. Many were afraid the old barn owl had taken leave of his senses. They refused to deal with him. Kenneth Ackerman in The Golden Ring describes the reaction of the young telegraph operator, Thomas Alva Edison as he witnessed the wild scene from a perch high above the floor. Edison reported that Fisk's floor broker Spires went crazy and that it took five men to hold him down. Amid the bedlam, James Brown, outraged and red in the face, barged into Fisk's temporary trading headquarters, shoving aside guards and threatened Fisk with ruination if he did not immediately put up margin to meet Brown's sales to Spires at ludicrous prices only hours before. Brown was unceremoniously swept out by Fisk's bodyguards. As the day mercifully came to an end, hundreds of ruined gamblers swarmed out of the rat pit onto the street. They quickly formed a lynch mob, and they massed outside of Fisk and Gould's temporary trading office, shouting for them to come out and show their faces. Tweed's Judge Barnard once again came to the duo's rescue this time probably saving their lives, dispatching sheriffs armed with a temporary restraining order, ordering the mob to disperse. The sheriffs held the throng back at gunpoint as Fisk and Gould hurriedly escaped out the back door. But the rampaging mob soon caught on and followed them, the duo now huddled inside the permanent office of Smith, Gould, Martin and Company nearby. Fisk, for all of his eccentricities, was a brave man. He appeared outside. He wanted to speak to the mob, to calm them. He was immediately bashed in the face. Bloodied, he retreated inside. Very late that night, when the mob finally dispersed, Fisk and Gould finally escaped to their eerie offices in the opera house uptown and barricaded themselves in with armed guards. It was there that Gould revealed to a shocked but relieved Fisk that he had been selling all along since reading Jenny Grant's letter. One thing was clear. If Fisk's purchases were enforced, they would wipe out the combined wealth of the Erie Treasury, the 10th National Bank, and the personal wealth of both Fisk and Gould. Their only salvation could come from disavowing Fisk's purchases and enforcing Gould's sales. And that, remarkably, is precisely what these two got away with. 
The Gold Exchange Bank, a clearinghouse for the gold exchange, was in deep trouble. By its charter, it had to stand good for all transactions on the gold exchange, but the reserves it held after the smoke cleared were woefully inadequate, and it had not yet received an accounting from the exchange. In frustration, the bank began to approximate balances and had already paid out amounts in error. The erroneous payments were not recoverable. Multiple litigations were instituted. Fisk had disavowed all of Spire's trades on his behalf. If Fisk defaulted, the Gold Exchange Bank could not survive. Once again, Gould turned to the courts to bail them out, and once again, Tweed responded, but this time with Justice Albert Cardozo. The name Cardozo is one greatly honored among constitutional lawyers and legal scholars alike. But the father of Benjamin Nathan Cardozo, the revered Supreme Court jurist of the Hoover and Roosevelt years, was regrettably a Tammany hack, who would eventually resign from the bench under threat of impeachment for malfeasance during this gold corner scandal. On Monday morning, Judge Albert Cardozo issued an order placing the Gold Exchange Bank in receivership and appointing one Augustus Brown, a Tweed crony, as receiver. Brown, on opening the bank's vaults, found only $500,000 in gold. When the news hit the street, panic again ensued, driving margin interest rates up to 5% a day, over 1,000% a year. Business came to a grinding halt. Wall Street was in shock, and the business community on Main Street was frozen in its tracks. Needless to say, the farm community was wounded worst of all. Well, how did this all end? Lockwood and Company, a fixture on the street comparable to Merrill Lynch today or Goldman Sachs, announced its failure. Lockwood had a large stake in the Lakeshore Railroad, which Commodore Vanderbilt prized very highly. Every potential suitor for the Lakeshore was already insolvent, and borrowing at these rates was almost out of the question for anybody. Vanderbilt did not achieve his enormous wealth by being timid. He determined to take a daring gamble. He sold off stock assets and then persuaded the Baring Brothers of London to lend him sufficient funds against railroad stock collateral to buy the lakeshore. The deal not only enriched Vanderbilt, but it had the effect of jumpstarting the entire market. But Friday, September 24th, 1869, would forevermore be referred to as Black Friday. As for the Gold Exchange Bank, after a siege of suits and countersuits, the bank wound up settling the infamous Black Friday trades at 25 cents on the dollar. But by that time, most brokers had acted on their own, settled informally in order to continue in business. The outlandish Fisk trades through Spires were all set aside by the clearinghouse under the tainted supervision of Tweed judges. Gould's brokers, on the other hand, were compensated in full for their sales, all of which were honored by the clearinghouse. Gould would go on to help shape our national rail system, including the Union Pacific Railroad, the Baltimore and Ohio, and would ultimately gain control of the Western Union Telegraph Company in a successful battle with Vanderbilt's heirs. Gould and his immediate family, however, would be forever blackballed by New York society. He was forbidden entrance as they were to its exclusive clubs. Gould himself would be vilified along with Rockefeller as one of the most hated men in America and labeled the Dark Prince of Wall Street. He would suffer and die of tuberculosis and dyspepsia at the age of 56, leaving an estate valued in today's money at over $1 billion. Clarence Darrow once said, quote, I've never killed a man, but I've read many obituaries with great pleasure. <laughs> Apparently, the New York Stock Exchange agreed with Darrow. The stock market rose on the news of Gould's death. Jim Fisk? died of gunshot wounds inflicted in the Grand Central Hotel in broad daylight, the victim of an erstwhile business partner and rival lover of Josie Mansfield named Ned Stokes. His principal mourner was a very distraught William Marcy Tweed. Corbin, the ruined man, took ill, retired to a farm in New Jersey, would pass away in 1880 at age 72. James Brown was tied up in court by Gould and his attorneys Tom Sherman and John Sterling for 10 years and finally dropped his suits against Fisk and Gould without recovering one dime. 
Brown went on to found the successful investment banking house of Brown Brothers Harriman. Sherman and his junior partner Sterling went on to found the successful Wall Street law firm of Sherman and Sterling, which today employs over 500 lawyers. Good old Daniel Drew went bankrupt. He died in 1878, leaving an estate valued at $148.51. Commodore Vanderbilt died in 1876, leaving an estate valued at $100 million and a rail empire which Gould would continue to attack throughout the balance of the century. The real loser in this debacle was the American farm community. The farmers would never really recover from the shock of Black Friday. The prices of corn, wheat, and other farm commodities, which fell dramatically between August and December 1869, would eventually rise again, fall again as wars, modernized machinery, increased foreign competition would take their toll. But the experience of Black Friday planted an ugly seed one that we find surfacing as mistrust by the rural community for bankers and gold. Farmers increasingly came to equate high interest rates and tight money with conspiratorial bankers and gold traders, both domestic and foreign. At first, we see this phenomenon surfacing in populist rhetoric of leaders, just as William Jennings Bryant, who beseeched our national leaders not to crucify the farm community on a cross of gold. Significantly, one of those most affected by this kind of populist rhetoric was Henry Ford himself, a product of the farm community. Eventually, these darker elements of populism, these rural paroxysms of fear, many of them anchored in the Black Friday experience, would be cleverly utilized by demagogues. They would be used as part of a worldview that would couple gold with xenophobic myths of foreign banking cabals to create and nourish right-wing extremist movements such as the Ku Klux Klan and the Knights of the White Camellia. These darker aspects of populism, its antipathies, which are so articulately described by Richard Hofstadter in the book The Age of Reform, helped to spawn the anti-Semitic ravings of Henry Ford in the Dearborn Independent in the early 1920s. They blended easily with the agrarian concept of the city as the home of moral corruption and evil. Under National Socialism in Germany, for example, gold became a despised form of decor. All SS medals and other Nazi paraphernalia were struck in silver. So unfortunately, financial follies of Fisk and Gould had much more far-reaching consequences than the bankruptcies and downfall of established family dynasties. They were not only precursor of the numerous scandals that would haunt the unsuspecting Grant administration, but Fisk and Gould's ill-fated attempt to corner gold would unfortunately reinforce far-reaching fears, fears which were already taking root in the American farm community and which would have repercussions well into the 20th century and beyond. Thank you.